Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am actually very delighted to introduce Hans Westberg for our closing keynote conversation on technology, digital inclusion, and the future of cybersecurity. And we'll get to each of these topics in the course of the next half an hour. Hans is the chairman and CEO of Verizon, which is the largest wireless provider in the United States and the largest wireless fiber optic and global information networks and services company in the world. We are very excited also because Hans will be one of our commencement speakers for School of Business this year as well. So Hans, when we have a commencement speaker, they usually like to take a selfie with the students. Absolutely. I think you should practice one yeah, we, now. We, let's How practice, about practicing yeah. one yeah, now? We because practice first. You, know, yeah. you never know. You never know. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I, I need to come down a little bit. Uh, actually, you know what? You will be taking this one. There you go. <laughs> Oh. Let's see if you can do this better. Oh, okay, 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 much okay. Yeah. I mean, oh my God. Oh, you got to do oh. it right. I, I, I need two hands. Uh, okay. Are you ready? You oh, yeah. I'm ready. You are oh, not okay. in the picture. No, 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 on him. That's All right. Good. Great. Thank you very you much. I need one hand. I need two. I need two. <laughs> okay. So, let me first, uh, I, before I take questions from the audience, and I will be taking questions from the audience, I think this iPad is set up for that. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I will start asking you some questions. But let me ask the audience one question before I ask you a question. Okay. How many of you are Verizon customers? Could you raise your hands? So I do know somebody in case your signal is bad, he can strengthen it. And by the that's way, Hans. That's about 50%, that's how many it should be. The others, I'm sorry for you, okay? <laughs> but Hans, the others that did not raise their hand, you because might want to send your marketing and sales team yeah, to them. Yeah, yo, yeah, but you know, they might be hard to reach, you know. <laughs> So let it's me, going to be a good conversation. You I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay. Um, it's, it's the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. So we it's, need it's to keep the energy up here. But okay. um, let me ask you about the latest technology, 5G. Uh, tell us more about what 5G is. What can it do in terms of consumer applications? How is Verizon going to wow us with 5G applications? It's an interesting question. I mean, uh, the design on 5G started in 2009. And in the industry of telecommunication, it's very interesting because all the competitors, they get together and they de decide what should the next wireless technology, how should it work? Uh, and then they go back and they start doing patents and they all share the patents and then they start building on it. That's why whoever has a phone in this room with everyone, you can go to any country in the world and the phone works. Think about that. So they, they share. So that's the start of it. I think it's important because many industries are competing on patents, et cetera. The telecom industry, they actually share all the patents in order to have the scale of it. So that's why you sell three and a half billion of these devices a year, which is by far the biggest consumer device. There's not even anything close to it. If you take refrigerators or whatever, it's not even close. So that was the start. 5G then, the design was, hey, we need to do a wireless technology that meets the need of enterprises, not only consumers. That was the first thought. So we need to have much better latency, uh, how quickly to ping, ping to the data centers. We need to be able to connect so many more devices because it's not only people. Uh, and we need enormous throughput. So I'll give you a couple of things, just to understand. So on 4G today, you can connect I would say at best per square kilometers, maybe 60, 70,000 people. Because that's how many people you have on a square kilometers, even if you're in a stadium. Uh, on 5G, you can have 1 million. And we know we're not going to cream in 1 million people on that. So it's devices. Uh, on the latency, on 4G today, at a good day, which I have on the Verizon network, on the 4G network, you can get 80 to 100 milliseconds. We design our 5G network today for 5 to 20 milliseconds in order to have edge capabilities like AI, et cetera. This is just a few of them. Then, of course, the speed and the throughput is 10x. All this in order actually to be able to mimic sort of the, the wireline industry by doing it wireless. So uh, the first use cases was very much around private 5D networks where you basically connect robotics and things to the wireless networks. Instead, they have a fiber to it. You need still fiber to the radios. but. Uh, on the, uh, the biggest use case right now is that uh, we actually do fixed wireless access to the home, meaning we do 5G to the home. Instead of a fiber all the way to your homes, we do 5G. And 
I just come from my earnings call because I had it this morning. This quarter, we added 397,000 new customers on our fixed wireless access. There's no other thing that is growing so fast for us. So 50% of the cost of bringing uh, broadband to your home is from the curb, where you have the radio, whatever you have, to the home. Because you need to dig, you need to have somebody installing it. If you take that away, you take 50% of the cost away. And not only that, you take also the speed up. So you can do it so much quicker, you can get broadband at home. And our broadband today, which is even more interesting, is it's self-installed. You can order it online, you get it home, you turn it on, and in average, it takes five minutes for you to have a broadband at home. And the longest time in those five minutes is to find your Wi-Fi password. <laughs> so that, that's just a couple of them. But it was a totally different design principle. And, and uh, my previous job, I have only two employers, was at Ericsson. And of course, that's where we started this design. So for me, it was one of the greatest opportunities in my life, I moved from, uh, from Ericsson, I came into Verizon, and we were first in the world with 5G for mobile phones, for fixed wireless access. So for me, it was sort of doing the whole journey, uh, being part of the design from the beginning, even though I'm not an engineer, but I was part of it, and I ended up. So, so that's what 5G can do today. And we have only seen the first phase of 5G, which is the adoption phase. The second phase is basically starting now where you start innovating on top of it, and then you have sort of the, the maturity phase where 6G will come. That's basically how it works. Yeah. So that's great. Um, uh, let me, let me, let me, so in, in some sense. I spoke a lot there, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's great. Uh, telecoms have used sophisticated algorithms throughout, uh, you know, from, 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 and applications for very, quite, quite some time. We have been talking during the day with various speakers about, you know, the advent of regenerative AI. Mm -hmm. Chat GPT. Yeah. Do you think that's a game changer for Verizon, or is it just an incremental improvement? Uh, I think that AI is uh, 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 is uh, is a game changer, very transformative uh, uh, when it comes to uh, managing large data sets and and draw the right conclusions for efficiency for end-to-end -end processes and, and and doing the right uh, value proposition. So yes, then there. With any technology, we know it. When you start getting connected, there are issues with privacy, cybersecurity. The same is with AI. Every new technology comes with 90% great things. It's always 10% that is uh, more risky and challenging that you need to manage. And of course, the same is with AI. I mean, uh, uh, biases in AI, uh, if you don't put the parameter on what you really want to answer in AI, it will answer whatever you ask. And they will continue to answer. So if you don't put limitation on it, it's always dangerous. And then people usually believe, that, oh, why don't you use AI? The only way to use AI is to have a data lake is big enough and is organized enough. Then you can do a lot of AI. But you cannot take 100 different data sets which is totally uh, uh, sort of disconnected and try to do something. So you need big data lakes in order to train the AI. Uh, we use it internally in order to be more efficient. We're very, very careful how much we, or when we use it, or if we ever use it for our customers. It's more about our internal efficiency so we can serve our customer better. Uh, because privacy is, is one of the most important brand values Verizon have. So uh, Hans, National Institute of Standards and Technology, they recently released um, its voluntary AI risk management framework. Mm -hmm. It's voluntary guidance and not specific to any industry. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear your thoughts on do you see whether voluntary guidance built in coordination with academia, civil society, private industry is sufficient to guide industry towards the most robust possible use yeah, of AI? I think it's a very good start. But remember, when you try to do regulation of, of quick moving technology, the, the risk you always end up with that you regulate something that already passed 10 years ago. Uh, so I think you need something, uh, first of all, you need uh, large uh, stakeholder discussions with all the stakeholders of the, uh, of the technology, or whatever it might be. And I think it's good to start with recommendation and what you should do. It, regulation is always difficult because whatever you're going to regulate, it's going to take so long so the technology is already past it. Uh, so I think that's principle guidelines. Then, of course, if people don't behave, then you probably need to go to the next step. But right now, in, in, the, in the beginning of this, I think it's much better to have multi-stakeholder discussions coming out with guidelines, people adopt it. I think the majority of 
corporations are very responsible in this point and they will listen to uh, good advice. Great, so there are some questions popping up, so I'm gonna change Already? topics. Yes, so they have oh been there. I have, be, I have to pay attention to two yeah, screens here and I can have multitasking here. How will you manage? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying my best, Hans, here. I think you're doing pretty so, good so far. <laughs> so, so this question I'm going to try and combine with, but it's really about leadership, and it's talking about, you know, from your lens as a CEO, can you talk about some of the biggest challenges leaders face in today's macroeconomic uh, environment? What are some of the opportunities? Uh, first of all, I became CEO, appointed CEO for a public company, my previous uh, company, 2009. Uh, so, yes, I'm old, uh, been around for a while and been CEO for many, many years. The progression has moved quite dramatically, what is important to be a CEO today, uh, how you actually uh, manage your employees, you manage your uh, shareholders, uh, your customers, and your society. Uh, all of them are suddenly being extremely important, might not have been equally important, uh, some 15 years ago when I started as CEO. So that has changed. You need to have a multi-stakeholder thinking in everything you do. And think about the stakeholders you have in front of you in every decision you take. It's very easy to optimize for one, really bad for another, or medium good for a third. You need to have that lens all the time and see that you don't compromise in too much in between them. Uh, the opportunities, of course, uh, when you have that, and I think that's how I feel in my job, uh, is that I have a platform that I can actually uh, uh, have an enormous impact with decision, I think, uh, and how we carry out our work as a company. Uh, I have so many examples where my organization is, if it's uh, diversity, inclusion, where they, they really believe that is driving better business for us because the stakeholders gonna, where our employees gonna think is right, our customers, our shares understand that that's gonna lead to better decisions and ultimately it's good for our society. Things like that in today's environment where our platforms are purchasing uh, is very big. Our turnover is $140 billion or 135. You can just imagine how much purchase, purchasing we do. We are uh, all the time looking at diverse suppliers, and we have the chance to actually uh, uh, groom and develop diverse suppliers based on our base. Not meaning that we're doing worse procurement or procuring for worse companies. We're actually getting a diverse slate of, of company. They're diversity owned, they're uh, small uh, firms, etc. So uh, we're doing a lot of that, and I think that is, of course, a unique opportunity for in this environment that you can do right, but still do the right for business. Uh, and I think that, that's how I see it with the things we are doing in our company uh, every day. Hans, so this is uh, great. And in following up on that leadership question, let me ask, a student is asking this question. Looking back, now, now that you know everything that you know, <laughs> where, would know you, where would Hans start if he were a student again? Uh, so, uh, what, my career was clear when I started. I wanted to be professional in sports, and as you see, I'm sitting here. Didn't go that well. <laughs> uh, but I always have done things that I love to do, and, uh, and working with people that, that I appreciated. That took me to living in seven countries, worked in basically every function you can ever dream of, uh, uh, and I never tried to see I need to do that, I want to be, uh, the CEO of Ericsson or CEO of Verizon. That was never my plan. I wanted to do things that I liked and where I think I had competence or capabilities. And that led me to these opportunities rather than uh, maybe trying to be something that you're not. I like to be around people. I think one of the things, I have so many weaknesses as a leader. I one that I think I'm good at, I'm, I'm good leading big organizations. And I've done that in all my life. Always lead big organizations. I come from team sports. I can do that every day. Uh, I think that's my strength. I, so, and that makes me happy. I think it makes me a better leader. Uh, rather than putting me checking travel expenses, which I did done for a while, and I was bad at it, and I didn't like it. So again, the advice I would give to my own self is, I did the right choices because I did things that I liked. I cannot look back and say I shouldn't have done that job or I shouldn't have studied that. 
Ultimately, it was things that I like to do, and that brought me where I am today, and I like what I'm doing today. Great, that's awesome. So I, I couldn't have told, by the way, just by, by the energy that you have here now. But, <laughs> so, but thank you, that is obvious, absolutely. And um, there is a question here which is a little bit tangential. Before I get into the questions, and there are multiple ones on yeah. digital uh, inclusion, yeah. which we will get to, there's a question which says, in the, is the future of telecommunications orbital satellites example Starlink, or more condensed ground-based infrastructure? Yeah, it goes back to scale. Uh, satellites have definitely a, a, a part of our delivery. We work with Kuiper, the Amazon uh, 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 satellite company. We believe it has a, an important piece of, especially when you come out to more rural places, to actually make the backhauling, meaning you need to send the data back. Then you do it with satellite, you cannot get fiber there. That's definitely, we think definitely it's an IoT play. Many, uh, many big uh, uh, oil and gas companies are in, in, in rural places. They need a lot of data. The only way to do it is satellite to get it back. So there's a lot of use cases. For the consumer product, I think uh, from a cost point of view, it is a challenge. Uh, you're, gonna, you, you're gonna go up against uh, three and a half billion to four billion of these every year, scale of the telecom industry or set up boxes which are using the same. They need their, their special sort of device in order to take the, the satellite signal down and then convert it to Wi Fi. So the cost point, then somebody can always price it. So I'm talking about cost point. That's why, I'm not sure that uh, uh, on the consumer side, we, we're probably going to see consumers using it in rural areas that can afford it, but it's not. Initially, I don't think it's a digital divide solution, given that the cost point on, on, on the device system in the telecom industry is so, far, so much bigger when it comes to the chipset and all of that. But that doesn't mean that it's an important piece of our strategy, it's part of our strategy, satellites, but maybe consumer is not the first. Uh, there are use cases, but not the, the majority of it. Great, so I know this topic of digital inclusion is very dear to you. Yes. Um, and some of the society's biggest challenges from digital inclusion to infrastructure investment, what do CEOs need to think about from the technological perspective to ensure that they remain, remain future-proof? Yeah, so this has been something, I, I started the work actually with the Millennium Development Goals that some of you might not even remember. That was before the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, 20, uh, 2000 to 2015. Uh, then the Sustainable Development Goals, I worked with them as well, and I was the, one of the biggest advocates, I want the goal 18. And the goal 18 is that every person on this planet should be, ha be able to be connected uh, uh, with, uh, to the internet and having access to it. Of course, we all know it became 17, so I missed that one. Uh, however, it's embedded in everything we do in our society in order to get education, healthcare, financial inclusion, uh, getting information in general, you need to be connected. Uh, so of course I spent a lot of time on that. And I usually divine, regardless who I speak to, I try to explain how it looks. I mean, today, roughly four billion people on this earth are connected. That means that 3.6 billion are not connected. Well, you, that's a big number. Out of the 3.6 billion, now you need to listen carefully, 3.2 billion of them have broadband coverage. Okay, I'll do it again. 3.6 billion are not using, are not connected to, to internet or online. 3.2 billion of them have broadband connection. That means 400 million people actually are outside the grid and that we need to work with. So what, so what is the thing here? So what you need to divide here, the challenge of be having people connected is the three things. Accessibility to the technology. You need, you need to have broadband coverage. Affordability. And sometimes you talk about, yeah, we need a service fee lower, but think about the devices, how expensive they are in many places in the world. To get a laptop, to get the computer, or get the, a, a phone. It's super expensive. And then, the last piece is usability. I mean, we all love to, to stream TV, et cetera, but that's not what I'm talking about here. You need, you need to have application online for healthcare, education, for fun, you need to open it for mobile banking. That, you need all three of them to have a digital inclusive world. Uh, and you need to work with all three of them in our society. 
99 or 95% of all the money to do the accessibility coming from the private sector. Pri private companies like Verizon or uh, Barty or uh, Vodafone are building the network with private money. Affordability is sort of a, a match between public and, and, and private, where we all the time get larger scale, we can offer better plans, uh, and of course scale of the industry bringing the devices down, but it's also subsidized program from governments. There are here in the US, for example, where low-income families can get subsidy to get the broadband connection or a, or a mobile phone. And then finally, more in, at least in general, if you take countries, the the, the, the online Apple application, they are actually owned by the government. I mean, healthcare, education, et cetera, is usually owned by that. There are some exceptions. I mean, US is a little bit different. Uh, so that needs to be developed from that side. So that combination is really what can drive the digital inclusion going up in the world. Accessibility, affordability, and usability. And I spend a lot of time on this in my life, and I come to that conclusion after years of working with telecom in so many places on Earth, and I know it shouldn't differ where you're born, or where you live, or who you are, that you actually have access to the basic infrastructure in our society. I was born in Sweden, in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, I had five minutes to my school, I had probably 10 minutes to the hospital. With the demographics of the world, that's not possible to build houses and schools that close to all the demographics growing. We need digital infrastructure in order to see that people on this earth have the same chance as we had, some of us, uh, in order to be part of our society. So, that's the five minutes on that. But for me, this is so important, and that's what we work with every day. I personally work with as well. So in some parts of the world, uh, like China and India, is, are, there, are, are certain countries doing better in terms of you know, I mean, think about getting India, more digital yeah, inclusion? I, I usually take the example of India. During COVID, in order to send out the, the, the COVID support, I don't know what it's called in India, they used the mobile phones to send it so there were no intermediate, no one even trying to steal the money from it. They went straight to the individual they needed. You need then assist, you need coverage, you need a device, and you need an application from the government that can actually send the subsidies out to the people in the COVID times where many people were suffering. That's a good example. There are other good examples. Uh, which we're working with and spreading to other countries. But I think that that's the thinking you need to have to use the infrastructure from a government in order to see that your citizens are connected and get the best information and the best service from the country. So tell me how academia can help in this collaboration between industry, government, uh, to promote technological innovation and digital inclusion. I think in general, I mean, academia has a very important piece of it because just the research and study of impacts of, of connectivity, getting connected, healthcare applications that are digital or remote uh, uh, learning, et cetera, and understanding uh, how that is affecting our society, I would say in a positive way because getting uh, education, getting healthcare are such uh, essential things in our society today uh, in order to prosper. So. Uh, that's how I see it, uh, that there's a lot of academia. I mean, we are working with this, I mean, uh, as I didn't get my goal 18, uh, I, I called the World Economic Forum and I told them I want to launch a program with you in order to uh, uh, get the next billion people being connected. And so I've been running that since uh, two and a half years back, uh, together with academia with uh, many, many countries and all the largest co companies in the world to connect one billion people, but only if they're connected with either healthcare, education, or financial inclusion. Not only that they have broadband, because broadband is an enabler. Uh, we are halfway through it. Uh, we, have, we have added some 450 million people uh, in the program that we have had. We have a couple of years left. We want to reach one billion. Uh, again, we need the rally public, academia, NGOs, and private sector to make it, and getting commitment. So that's, what I, that's called the Edison Alliance, uh, where I, I became the chairman, and I'm, I'm leading that with the World Economic Forum. So do you think there is room for this collaboration between competitors in the industry? Of course, there are a lot of competitors in there, because we all have the same desire that getting people connected we know is good for our business, mm -hmm. that people are getting connected, but it's good for our society. Mm -hmm. This is how it should work. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 
I usually say, I, I, I like philanthropy uh, and everybody should do it, but it's not for a business. We should do societal work that is connected to our business. We do a lot of education in the US. Over 10 years, we basically spend $3 billion uh, to uh, uh, connect schools. We connect the school, we give them the devices, we give them a digital STEM education. That's what we do. So, so what is that good? First of all, broadband is important. We think that's, that's our business. Getting students to like uh, STEM uh, and thinking about Verizon. That's great, they're gonna work for us later on. So it's part of our strategy to be a stronger company, not philanthropy for me. This is part of our societal. And then on top of that, we have volunteers. That where we are very clear to our employees, you can volunteer hours, but only to the programs and the projects that is connected to our strategy. So they can actually work in one of these schools to maintain the equipment or educate the students on how to use the equipment. That goes to the volunteers. Great. So this is a cybersecurity forum. I'm going to ask you a question okay. on that that has just come in, Off that which, is, uh, which is, you know, uh, what, is, what, is, what is Verizon's, from your lens, what is Verizon's top contribution towards cybersecurity going to be? <laughs> it's probably that, that we have the largest <laughs> network in the world, and probably we, we see more than many others are seeing uh, when it comes to cyber threats, and, and of course having a, a lot of threats coming in every day. Um, we, we spend a lot of time on it. We, of course, share a lot with our industry peers, with other companies uh, uh, in order to see that we are prepared and what we need to do. Uh, of course, we fortify our product. We sell cybersecurity products as well. Uh, but of course, it's all, uh, all about us securing our own network, having almost 140 million subscribers on the, net, on the wireless network, for example. Uh, extremely important to have a security. Uh, it, so our contribution is that we participate in every conversation with other uh, constitution. This is nothing you sit by yourself. It's actually see that you share and learn more from others, especially from incidents, how the threat, uh, uh, threat uh, sort of people are, are coming, how they're doing it, uh, what they're demanding, how can we work together to do that better, if that with law enforcement or whatever as well. So that's our contribution, and we understand we have a big responsibility given the size of the network uh, and how much things we are touching in the network. So let me ask you one final question. You are hey. sitting at GW. We have a lot of faculty and students here. We would love to hear from your lens on what should be the research topics that we should be pursuing that will help the industry, not just Verizon, but the industry, particularly as it relates to cybersecurity or artificial intelligence or uh, I think in artificial intelligence, I think we need uh, a lot of research around the impacts, uh, especially on, on, on the things that are a little bit tougher, privacy, uh, cybersecurity, uh, uh, um, ethical uh, uh, AI. I think we need more research on that as this evolves. Definitely one area, even though I'm not sure, we're probably already doing it, uh, but that's one area. And then around cybersecurity, I think cybersecurity is, is such a moving uh, target as uh, you all, the threat actor is always looking for the next. It's hard to research on it. I think it's more to understand uh, uh, the cybersecurity environment, why and how cybersecurity is happening, and what they're after, and then understanding how do you, how do you uh, secure yourself? Because you cannot secure everything. You need to think about what are the really critical things you need to, need to secure, and, and those type of things are, I, I would definitely think are important. Well, Hans, this has been just an energizing conversation. I have just enjoyed your energy, your, your, your thought Thank process you. here. Thank you very much Thank for you. doing this. And to our speakers and moderators throughout the day and the guests, Thank you. I think we have launched a wonderful business and policy forum this year. Hopefully, we'll continue with other topics as well as we go along. Uh, I do want to say that everybody is invited to continue the discussions. Many, many topics have come up during the day from all different angles um, during our networking reception right after this. And that networking reception is exactly the same place where the lunch was, but it will look different. Uh, it will be in that ballroom and the third floor in the University uh, Student Center. And our School of Engineering, uh, GW Engineering students, will actually have posters there, and they would love to interact with the folks who are guests from outside. 
to talk about their research. And you will be impressed with these kids who are just working on some absolutely fascinating and wonderful things. So again, thank you for your support. Thank you for the GW team, which has worked very hard. Um, this is not our day job where we organize a conference like this. So I really appreciate the team. And it has really been a village. And I'm very, very fortunate to be part of that village. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's have a great reception after this and a round of applause. From Thank you.